so great to be with you all this morning. And uh, depending on your week, if it's been a good week or a difficult week, I think this subject is, is really uh, good for either if it's been a great week or a difficult week. And uh, we're talking uh, today about revival. And so what I want to do is I just want to begin by reading the passage and then we can dive in. If you have a Bible, we're in Second Chronicles 1, verses 7 through 12. 2 Chronicles 1, verses 7 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, You have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for long life, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. Let's pray. Lord, as we talk about revival, as we talk about growing in our love for you, Lord, might you be in this place. Be here now in your name. Amen. Well, the series that we're in is called Revival Stronger Than Ever. And really, what a big thing revival is, is it's when our affections grow in our awe and amazement of God. That when we grow in our love, when we grow in our joy, when we grow in our peace of how amazing God is, is This is a huge thing that revival is. And I believe that we have several tools in this passage that would grow revival in us. Because I don't know about you, but I know for me, as I look at things right now in America, I pray that there would be a revival. And a lot of times what we see is that before there can be a revival in the continent, there has to be revival in the local church. And before there can be revival in the local church, there has to be revival in the individual. And so I believe that as we look at this, there are going to be tools that we can all use to grow our affections for God, that our love and delight in Christ, where everything else that we desire would fade and where Christ would be the most joyous thing in our lives. Uh, If you're taking notes, the, the big idea, the sermon in a sentence is, When we pray for priceless wisdom, God will answer abundantly. I just want to say that one more time. The sermon in the sentence is, when we pray for priceless wisdom, God will answer abundantly. And I have four major points with that. The first tool when it comes to revival that we see in this passage, verse 7. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. The first tool, the first point is pray. Pray. If you desire revival, if you desire for your emotions to grow in relationship with God, the reality is that the more that we pray, the more revival will happen. And yet the truth is that the less that we pray, in the same way that the less revival will happen. So the first one is pray. Verse 7. In that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. Now, as we see here, Solomon has just become king. Imagine for a moment being in Solomon's shoes. God comes and says, ask anything and I will give it to you. I will give it to you. Now, as I read this passage over the years, it wasn't until even studying it this last week that I realized, wait a minute, just how God asked Solomon, ask what I shall give you in the same way the Son of God in the New Covenant has the same thing where he says, ask, seek, and knock. And how Yahweh literally came to Solomon and said, ask, ask what I shall give you. In the same way, God comes to us and 
through his promises, he says, ask what I shall give you. And, and we have that promise. I just want to read it in Matthew 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. We also have this promise from God that when we ask, seek, and knock, God does amazing things. And later on I want to talk about, well, what happens when God says no? Because it's possible that there might be people here that have, been, have had difficulty when God has said no. And because even though God said yes to Solomon, for us, a lot of times, God might say no. He might, he might say other things. And so we'll, we'll talk about that for sure. But when, we, when it comes to the will of God, when we're praying for good things, the Bible does give us a promise. He wants to answer. He wants to answer us. But, but I do have to say this. In a group this size and those listening online, the Bible is clear. The Bible, uh, God does answer believers but it actually says that God does not hear the prayers of unbelievers. And so if you're here and you might not be a Christian, the first prayer that God will ever hear from you is when you repent and believe in Christ. And so this passage, these tools are for believers. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, might you repent, might you believe in Christ and, and as he is able to to hear. But so now we come at, for believers as we see this tool is for us when we ask. The crazy thing is that, so that passage that I just looked at, ask, seek, and knock, that's the positive. But in the same way, there's also a negative, there's a negative passage that I think is very encouraging. It actually says that there are times, not always, but there are times in our own lives where it might be that there might be a good thing that God desires to give to us. And the reason we might not have it yet is because we have not asked enough. I want to read this in James 4. It says, you do not have because you do not ask. There are times where it's possible that we might not have a certain thing because we have not asked enough. Think about the the widow. The widow in the book of Luke begins to knock at the unjust judge's door, and and she just knocks over and over and over again, and finally the unjust stands up. He he says, even though I'm an unjust judge, I'm so annoyed by her knocking, I'm going to come down and open the door. And the reason why Jesus was saying is, if this unjust judge opened the door, how much more our heavenly father will he do that? And so uh, as we're talking about prayer, I think it's so good for us just to talk about cultivating godly prayer lives. Because every person in this room probably is in a different place when it comes to your prayer life. And so my hope is that as we read this, that it would spur all of us on to go to whatever the next level is. If you don't pray at all, that you would have that prayer. Let's say you pray once a week, that you would go further than that. If you pray daily, that there would be growing as well. And so as we look at this, uh, Leonard Ravenhill has a great quote. If you desire to know anything of prayer, read Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill has such a desire for growing prayer in people. This is what he says. Leonard Ravenhill, he quotes about how there are 24 hours in a day. You work eight, you sleep eight, what do you do with the other eight? You work eight hours, you sleep eight hours, what do you do with the other eight hours? And his point that he's getting at is that as we have certain amounts of time that we would cultivate and grow habits of prayer, he tells the story of a man named uh, Praying Payson in Portland. And Praying Payson in Portland, when they prepared him for his casket, when he passed away, they found two grooves in his knees. They found two calluses on his knees. And as they went to where his apartment was, they found two large holes in the side of his bed that were six and seven inches deep. And that was the place where he always prayed. And what happened was the reason he had calluses on his knees was because he was constantly seeking intercession from God. And might we grow in that as we go to whatever that next step might be for you, cultivating godly prayer lives. But now I want to talk about this. What happens when God says no? That is one of the most painful, difficult things that a Christian can go through. And what I found is really there are three major answers that God gives when we pray. God will say yes, God will say no, and God will say wait. And it's possible that there might be some really difficult things that you've gone through, and it's possible that God said no, or he might have said wait. 
And one of the things that is so encouraging that the Bible says over and over is I know for me, in the times where I felt like God was saying no, sometimes it felt to me like, oh, God isn't listening to my prayer. But a lot of times when God says no, the reality is that it's not that he's not listening to your prayer. It's that he is listening and his answer is no. Like imagine if I went to my dad when I was younger and I said, hey, dad, could I have this thing? If my dad was to say no, it's because he, he knew that it was not a good thing for me. He would be able to see my circumstance and he would say, this does not seem like a wise thing for John. I'm going to say no because his will was better than mine. And there are times, as painful as it might be, where we wonder why has God said no? Why has God said wait? And it, it might be a time where we must go, God's will is better than mine. In fact, did you know something? Did you know that Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless son of God, Jesus prayed to the Father, and the Father said no to Jesus. And if the Father was able to say no to Jesus, we must realize that if Jesus, the sinless, perfect Savior, was able to have God say no, that we can also trust when he says no to us. I want to read this in Luke 22. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was literally able to say, not my will, but yours be done, even though he desired not to go to the cross. And yet he said, but not my will, yours be done. Sometimes we have those moments where we have to go, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So firstly, pray. What is that next step? Just think about that. What is the next step that, that you need cultivating godly prayer habits? Number two, seek wisdom more than wealth. Seek wisdom more than wealth. So God says, ask what I shall give you. And this is what Solomon says. And Solomon said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled. For you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people. For who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? So here we see that God, uh, that, that Solomon asked for wisdom. And we see later on that in the text that God, he, he affirms that Solomon did not ask for money. Because think about it for a moment. You're the king and you see all of these people and God says, hey, what can I give you? In that moment, it's very possible that he could have said, you know what? I want money, I want fame, I want wealth, and yet, no, he saw, I need wisdom from above. If there's any way for me to be able to help the, the people that I'm going to govern, I need wisdom. And what I want to do just for a bit is talk a little bit about why wisdom is better than wealth, why it's better than wealth. And what I want to do is I want to zoom out throughout the whole Bible and talk about the big picture, and I want to zoom in. And another way of talking about it, I want to talk first about sanctification and then talking about, or I'm sorry, salvation, and then zooming in, talking about sanctification. First, why is it zooming out? Why is wisdom better than wealth? Money can buy a lot of things. Money can buy televisions. Money can buy uh, movies. Money can buy homes, cars, travel, you name it. But there's one thing that money cannot buy. Money cannot buy a relationship with the triune God. We need wisdom for that. Uh, money can save people from all sorts of peril. Uh, people, money can uh, buy from, a sh it can buy shelter, it can buy weapons, it can buy different types of things that might protect. And yet the reality is that it does not matter the amount of money that someone has. If they do not have wisdom from above to believe in Christ, the sad truth is that if someone had all the money in the world, it would not protect them from the wrath of God because of their sin. And in reality, the, it is wisdom that helps someone realize, I have sinned against God, I repent and believe in Christ. And it is only through wisdom that, that someone is able to grow in their knowledge of that. So firstly, we see salvation, zooming out. But now zooming in, talking about sanctification. I, I just want to read 1 Peter 1. You are ransomed from the feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So firstly, 
we see that wisdom is better than wealth because it saves. Wisdom is how we grow in our understanding of who God is, what pleases God. But now what I want to do is I want to talk about sanctification. And I want to talk specifically in this text, why is wealth better? Why is wisdom better than wealth? And and what, what I want to see here is that as we see this text, Solomon, where he could have chosen the temporary, what he ends up doing is he sees the kingdom of God and he chooses the kingdom of God over what might be temporary. Notice in Matthew 6, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And what I want to do now, just for a minute, is I want to talk about how we have one life. And as we have one life, the reality is that as we have different uh, amounts of time that we are here on earth, as we have one life, that we would grow in our being able to give every second to God, everything in our lives to God. And uh, what I want to do is I I just want to to give a personal analogy for a second. Uh, Imagine for a moment... The, the moment where we all have that moment where we stand before God. And as we, we stand before God, we see God, and between us and God is an altar. And imagine on that altar, imagine, let's say that on earth we have done a billion things throughout our entire life. And as we look at the, the, the entire altar, that we would ask the question, as we see the entire altar, how many things are we able to grow in this life so that there are so many things on that altar that we can do for God. I just want to read this in 1 Corinthians 3. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has done built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So imagine that moment. We're face to face before God. Everything is on the altar. Let's just say that we've all done a billion actions. The Bible says here, I believe as many do, that everything that we do for God will be stored up in heaven as gold, silver, and precious stones. And everything that we do for self will be stored up as wood, hay, and straw. And my hope is we see, as we talk about revival, and as we realize that we only have one life, that we would use every moment of our time, every moment of our money to best glorify God. Now, uh, I I heard somebody once say, but isn't storing up treasure in heaven kind of selfish? Isn't it selfish to basically store up a lot of treasure that one day that we will be able to have for ourselves in heaven? And yet my view is, as many believe it as well, that Revelation 4 is a picture of why we store up treasure in heaven. You have the 24 elders around the throne, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And really, I believe that the treasure in heaven that we are storing up on earth will one day be offered back at Christ's feet. That as we are able to use our time and our money, that we will use the best opportunities that God has given us And that we will say, I desire to give as much as I can for time and money to God. Because I know for me, as I think about the moment that I stand before Christ, I see Christ, he's died for my sins, he's taken the wrath for me, and I see that he's wiped away all my tears, death is no more. As I see the the bliss in paradise of heaven and I see Christ right there, I don't want to go up to him with two blocks of gold. I don't want to go up to him and say, Lord... Thank you so much for sacrificing everything for me. Because you've sacrificed everything, I want to give you these two blocks of gold. I pray that that this text would grow. I know for me, as I've thought about it, it's like, Lord, I want to store up as much gold, silver, precious stones as possible. Uh, Charles Wesley, he talked about how basically he desired all of his time. He cared so much about his time that he desired to basically cut up his time into 20-minute segments. And he was like, I don't want to waste a second. I don't want to waste a minute because there are so many different things that are are happening with, if it be media, if it be technology, movies, television, those aren't wrong to watch at all. And yet a lot of times what happens is, I know for me, I find those times where, wow, did I just spend an hour watching that? Did I spend two hours? And it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And I want to talk about this as well. I am not at all saying that we shouldn't have hobbies. And yet the Bible says, whether we eat or drink or whatever we should do, do all to the glory of God. 
that even in our hobbies, when you're enjoying something uh, with a friend, you're enjoying something by yourself, that you're able to say, Lord, glory be to you. Did you know you can store up treasure in heaven just by enjoying something? Because as we enjoy things and we give thanks to God, that is a way that we are able to store up that treasure in heaven. And so once again, as we see looking at the eternal over the temporary, a major reason for that is because it's not that we're storing up treasure in heaven basically to, to have it all be put on us, but every single thing that we use on earth to be stored up in heaven, we will offer once again at Christ's feet. And it is a way for us to say, Jesus, you died for me. You died for all of my sins. And because of that, I desire to give you everything that I had in this life. As we go on, so firstly, we talked first about why wisdom is better than wealth in the big picture. And then we we zoomed in talking about sanctification that it shows for us, because here's the truth. Wisdom desires for us to realize that we will spend eternity somewhere, that life is short, eternity is long. Wealth wants for us to think about the now. Money wants for us to think about the now. It wants for us not to think about the future. It wants us to think about the moment, instant gratification. And as we see over and over, the Bible, it it almost like it yells to us that we will spend eternity somewhere and that this life is so important. Something as well as we're talking about why wisdom is better than wealth, just notice how the Bible describes, how it describes the word, how it describes wisdom, how it describes this treasure, which is the word. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Notice Job 28, I love this, Job 28, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold, and silver cannot be weighed as its price. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls." And so as we're talking about revival, how can we grow in our affections for God? First, we talked about prayer. What is the next step that that we can all do in our prayer lives? And now talking about how we can seek wisdom more than wealth. Might we take our spiritual chisels and the moments that we get away with God, that we get away in his word, that we would chisel away at the word of God, that we would chisel away at the mines of gold that we can find in the word. Uh, I heard one pastor say this. He said, keep knocking, when it comes to reading the word, he said, keep knocking at the tree until all its fruit falls. Keep knocking and knocking and knocking at the tree. So number one, pray, pray. Number two, wisdom is better than wealth. And just once again, the big idea, when we pray for priceless wisdom, God will, uh, God will answer abundantly. As we go now to the third point, Number three, wealth is fleeting. I just want to talk for a minute about how the, the, the temporary is fleeting. And it's so easy to, to get caught in this, this fleeting world. Verse 11, God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you and have not even asked for long life. Notice those five. And all five of those things are temporary possessions, wealth, honor, the life of those who hate you, and long life. Let's look at possessions, things that we own, wealth of the amount of money, honor. Honor is an easy one, I think, for people to fall into, meaning that that people are basically living life to desire honor, fame, glory, popularity, the life of those who hate us. In the, in the Old Covenant, we had certain times where we see there are certain people who would attack other people in their life, and yet in the New Covenant, we see that we need to love our enemies. In the Old Covenant, we would see these things, these psalms, where it was almost like it was calling for the death of people, and yet we see in the New Covenant, in the Sermon on the Mount, we see it says, love your enemies. And here, God commands him that he did not pray for the life of those who hate him. And and that's another thing. We want to make sure to pray for our enemies. Also, long life. I was shocked by this. I was shocked that God commends Solomon 
for not praying for a long life. And as we see, one of the the things that ring in the New Testament is that we are to pray Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, might you come as fast as possible. Might you come now that I might spend eternity with you as fast as possible. Now, I want to say this as well. I'm not, this text or the word does not at all say it's wrong to have money at all. The, the word is talking about love of money. It's not having money that's wrong. It's when someone loves money, habitually, unrepentantly loves money. I want to read a warning passage in James that talks about not only the temporary, uh, temporariness of riches, but the danger, the danger when we fall into loving money more than God. James 5. Now, when it says you rich in James 5, I believe it's talking about the unbelieving rich. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. A Christian can struggle with love of money. They can struggle with having that, uh, that love for money. But what this is saying is if someone has given themselves over to love of money, if they have given themselves over, the reality is that this says that they will, be, they will experience the judgment of God. Because it says in the Sermon on the Mount, once again, that we can only have one master. We cannot have two masters. So that's the negative passage. But then as we're talking again about money, look at some of the positive passages. Luke 6, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And then 2 Corinthians 9, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So the way that we use our time, the way that we use our money, either we can be storing it up in heaven as gold, silver, precious stones, or we can be storing it up on earth as wood, hay, and straw. So number one, as we're looking at the the discussion of revival, prayer, prayer is so big, Secondly, seeking wisdom more than wealth. Thirdly, that we realize that wealth is fleeting. And then lastly, God generously answers our prayers. I want to go back to the first point just for a second. We, we kind of just started by talking about how there are times where God says no. And that can be a really painful, difficult thing. Sometimes when God says wait, that can be very difficult. And, and what I want to just talk about for a minute is that Either if God says yes, no, or wait, when we rest and trust in his will, a lot of times his will is far abundantly better than we can ever imagine. Notice what it says in the middle of 11. God says, but have asked for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. And Ephesians 3.20, I would say, really, this is happening happening to Solomon. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, that when we pray and we say, Lord, I don't know why you said no, I don't know why you said wait, but when, when that happens, that we say, but Lord, your will is better than mine. I just want to tell a, a personal story of that, of just having those moments where, where I had to wait. Uh, for me, I was uh, single for a long time, and that was really hard. And I remember I met a guy uh, back at my home church, and uh, he had told me his testimony about how he had gotten saved in prison. And he had gotten saved in prison, and he talked to me about how he just felt called to pray for a wife, and he began to pray, and he was very specific. And, and as he was specific, slowly after he ended up meeting his wife. And it was only after that that he went, wait, I prayed for that. I prayed for that. And as a single guy, I was like, oh, I want to try that. And so I began to pray. I was like, Lord, might you, might you give me a, a wife? And, and just, I began to pray about that. And even when, as it was wait for a long time, as, as Gretchen and I got to know each other, what ended up happening was it was while we were dating and engaged and married over that time, I was like, wait a minute, I prayed for that. Wait, I prayed for that too. And I share that because 
as we look, if, if, if it's wait, if it's no, a lot of times the, the really difficult thing is, is going, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I want to trust in your will either way. I want to trust in you fully. And so just to summarize everything we talked about with really four major tools that, that when it comes to revival, firstly is this, what's the next step that each person that we can all take in prayer? If it be praying once a week, if it be praying daily. Secondly, what are ways that we can seek wisdom more than wealth? Seeking it, complete, wisdom completely more than wealth, seeing how precious it is, and also realizing that eternity is long and life is short. Thirdly, looking how wealth is fleeting. It, it is fleeting. And then lastly, talking about how God generously answers our prayer, that that would also spur us on, that when God says no and when he says wait, that we would also be able to trust in his will. And this all leads back to the, the big idea, which is when we pray for priceless wisdom, God will answer abundantly. And with that, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this text. Lord, thank you for the, the tools that we see in it. Lord, we, you have given us one life. And Lord, thank you that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And Lord, after we're saved by faith in Christ, thank you that we are able to use this life to store up as much gold, silver, and precious stones as we can in heaven. Lord, I pray that through this passage, through these tools, might we grow in our love and our affections for you. In Jesus' name, amen.